this is how the web looks like for me. You see this ad on the top? Well, how do they all know I need a new pair of sneakers? Seriously. That question is what I had in mind when I started working on the project I'm going to show you now. So John Battelle and Adobe needed an interactive piece to explain how advertising works on the web. So this is what uh, my coworkers and I at the Office for Creative Research built for them. Our work reveals a huge network of companies who strive to define who you are and how much you are worth as a consumer. And publishers identify you, they put your profile on the marketplace, and then run an auction among hundreds of advertisers. And that whole process happens in a fraction of a second. Every time you load a web page, that's a lot. So we were amazed to realize how very few people actually know about it, considering it fuels the whole internet. We got many tweets from people who discovered about this. Some of them were very enthusiastic about it. Some of them were very creeped out. Uh, this one is my favorite. Fascinating, impressive, and scary. There's definitely something scary about how we are constantly tracked on the internet nowadays. And today we're going to explain why and what we can do about it. So every day, every minute, actually any time you are online, either while talking to someone, reading something, searching for, buying something, moving somewhere, doing nothing, that triggers information collection by data providers. Companies like Google, among others, uh, have become the exclusive owners of huge amounts of interconnected, interconnected information. And you could think those information are harmless, but they know your age, they know your marital status, they know your gender, they know your education, your buying habits, your politics, opinions, everything. And that data can be misused. It can lead to prejudice, it can lead to discrimination. A good illustration of this is in 2009 when MIT researchers built up an algorithm able to guess if someone was gay based on their uh, friends list. And what do you think that information can be used for in the many, many countries where people, uh, gay people are segregated? So a few years ago when I learned my data was sold to advertisers, I was pretty much okay with that. You know, it's advertising, fair enough. But when today I learn that my data is sold or given away to government agencies, it's not okay anymore. Because what's next? Well, my bank refused a loan based on my DNA. That's messed up. Because we're not considered as people anymore. We are considered as a series of facts. And for this reason, we need to fix privacy now. So what do we do? What about choosing alternative services uh, that replace Google and Facebook, the bad guys, with a better approach to privacy? What about using encryption technologies that add a layer of protection on our software? What about not using the web anymore? Meh. So all those solutions uh, fail with real life people. Because, uh, not, not because they, they don't care about privacy, but because those tools provide su resistance to surveillance. Resistance in a very literal sense, because they slow down surveillance, but they also slow down users. Because encryption technologies are so counterintuitive to use, and alternative services ask their users to give up their habits and comfort. And let's be honest here. Even a lazy nerd like me is too lazy, uh, a paranoid nerd like me is too lazy to do that, yes. I'm paranoid and lazy. So in my point of view, it shouldn't be, when you want to focus on the end user's point of view, it shouldn't be about resistance but resilience. In other words, we shouldn't have to choose between sharing and protecting our online identity. It should be both, and that's what I've been looking for as a designer and a user. So uh, 
one year ago, when I um, when I started being really interested in this subject, I, I was still a student. I started I started collecting all my data. So what I did is go on every website I've ever subscribed to and try to get my data back. This is what I collected. Ten years, ten years worth of data. It's thousands of emails, conversations, geolocations, contacts, transactions, uh, media, and even stuff I totally forgot about, like conversations I had when I was 13 years old, barely spelling any word properly. And so I started analyzing that data, um, building by charts, bar charts, time series, and stuff that designers like to do. And this one is uh, one I really like. It's a huge map of every conversation that I've had over the last 10 years. Everything here is an email or a conversation. And it is so relevant on a personal level because I get to explore my memories and discover a very detailed portrait of my digital self. And it's time travel because you get to see all those content over the years, over the months, but it's also like space exploration because all those contents were happening in different services that you can explore and highlight like this. And those conversations, some of them happen in public spaces, private spaces, whatever, everything is in here. And more important, importantly, it reveals what or who matters in my life. And this makes me realize that online identity issues are not so much about protection, but rather property and knowledge. So after building all those tools for myself, I realized that those experiences need to be available to everyone. This is why I tried to build something for a larger audience, and this is what we've been working with my old all-time friend, uh, Maxim Favas. So Maxim and I uh, build an app, designed an app, that, that collects, explore, and share your personal data. But what, what it really does is letting you own your digital life. So first, as a user, you, uh, you learn that all those big data bad guys keep Tracking and tracking you on internet all the time, and it sucks, but you cannot prevent them from doing so. So what you're going to do is exactly the same thing, only better. And this is the first thing this app does. It collects every single piece of data you've ever produced and will collect every interaction as they're happening in the future. All your memories, all your interactions, everything will be in your devices. And because all those big companies are trying to do the same thing but compete together, they will never be able to access to as rich and accurate data as the primary source, which is yourself. This makes of you the best data provider out there. So once you have all that data stored in your devices, you can start exploring it from any angle. You can explore it free from any prison, and every piece of data is brought into a larger context. It takes you back to forgotten places, reminds you of your personal stories, and it just shows you how you felt at the time those interactions happened. And more importantly, it reminds you how important those stories are, because this is who you are on the web. And it turns something that's very abstract, very abstract facts, into something you can actually relate to. And the great thing about this is that it's not only an exploration tool. It is the center of your online identity. It enables you to share your data even more than before, but under your own terms. Because remember, you became your very best data provider. That puts you in a great position to actually define how that information will be used starting from now. And so the service allows you to share your data with 
service providers such as social networks, small apps like the one I showed you before, innovators, and any geek friend you trust enough. And thanks to you, those developers and apps will access to richer data than ever before. Flickr here will access to most of my pictures from over many years, but it has a counterpart. You know those terms of service that you have to agree upon when you subscri subscribe to a service? Well, if those services want to access your data, they will have to agree on yours. And if they don't, if they happen to not respect the deal, you just cut the access, as simple as that. So that's it. Um, there's a very, very long way ahead of us, obviously. And our project won't solve privacy issues. It won't solve surveillance state. It won't protect your digital life from prejudice and discrimination. What it does, though, is decentralize a power that is meant to be shared. And by getting rid of third parties, it creates a more sustainable and innovative web where small organizations don't have to rely on huge corporations. And more importantly, it builds trust for us, the users. Because when you own your digital life, it makes you aware and enables you to make educated choices for yourself. I think that Big Brother definitely exists. And it's time for us to acknowledge it. But if we learn how valuable our digital life is, I think we can make the best out of it. Thank you.